Welcome back to the Lantern Rouge Cycling Podcast, a big Sunday of cycling. Gent Vedelhem, both men and women's editions, as well as the final stage of Volta Catalunya. Big shock upset there. Uh, <laughs> no, that, that's a joke. There wasn't. Uh, Gent Vedelhem with the two good races today. The men's race first, starting in Ypres, un- near the Menin Gate, which is under being renovated, I believe, from what I could see in the, the women's race, uh, finishing in Vedelhem, 252Ks. It's, it's basically monument length, this race. And it's the... I mean, San Remo is now a Sprinters Classic again, but this is the Belgian Classic, apart from Brugge de Pana, that are well, the most prestigious one, where the Sprinters really have a good chance because the first 150 kilometers are, are flat, although there's crosswinds in Demura. There was a cross tailwind today. Then they do the three repetitions of the Camelberg. The first two times are from the Belvedere side, which is slightly easier, uh, but has the Monteberg before. And then the third time they do the Barneberg and then the Camelberg Ossuaire side, uh, which crests about 30 uh, five kilometers from the finish. And these sort of climbs are 700 meters, 11% cobbled. Uh, the Ossaware has some steep 18% sections in there as well. So it doesn't have the multitude of climbs uh, a Kerner, RVV, or E3 has, and it has a flat finish, but it's still, uh, and that makes it actually a really interesting race a lot of the time. I agree. And it's kind of like Kuhn in that way, where you've got this fight between the riders that do attack on those hills or a group that goes on the moon and the the echelon zone before the hills and the sprinting peloton behind the peloton with leftover sprinters that do have some teammates left and it's a battle of will the teammates of the sprinters be enough to take back the riders ahead and i'll be honest yes we say this is one of the sprinting classics perhaps of of the flemish ones but if you go through the last 10 years of of this race i feel like there's not much left of that and if i go through it in my head Wout van Aert won in an echelon segment paulini won in echelons van Avermaet probably wasn't a sprint if I recall correctly, then Binyam won by running away with Laporte and Van Gestel and Steven and so forth, then Laporte and Van Aert both rode away together, and th- there's just so many editions where it's not actually a sprint that I've, I've, I feel like it's not really a sprinter classics anymore. The hills are decisive here if you're strong enough to pull it off because it's often that the domestiques that are left over to bring the sprinters back just aren't good enough, and that brings us to the start list of this race where Mathieu van der Poel and Philips are here in the same team, which makes for a really interesting dynamic. I was really curious how they were going to use van der Poel and, and Philipson, because you've got your rider to attack on the hills, but you've also got your man as a backup for a potential sprint. So I was very much looking forward to those two, but who else is here? Because Van Aert and Laporte ain't here, and I think Trotnik crashed out early on in the race. Like, who was here as, like, leader for Visma, for example? Visma Coy Lisa like Coy in the sprint. Uh, was the was the plan? Because uh, yeah, no Laporte because he's been sick, and Van Aert's doing Dwarz do Vlaanderen. So uh, they did convey him when they won it two years in a row, swapping to do the Wednesday race, uh, which Van der Poel did last year. And then the other that means that the big contender is the Trek, because the the other strongest team on on Friday was Trek with Sturven, uh Pedersen, and and this is also a better race for Milan because there's less hills in it, less steep repeated hills. So Trek came with a good team, and you, not even just them. Like Kirsch was excellent uh, on Friday, and uh, there's Navais who was very good for Ineos. Mm, no Lascano, so he wasn't here. There's Dali Benji. I mean, in theory, this should be Dali's best classic almost. I don't see why this is harder than Omlop for him to win. I think so too. Like Omlop, Kuhne, Kent Wevelgem, and maybe a Dwarsdorf London, even though that's become yeah, a bit Dwarsdorf. harder looking at the start list, I would say. So <laughs> those first two are definitely the ones I'm looking at, but he wasn't good at E3, and the team around him also wasn't good at sort of Brent van Moor at E3, so I was more worried about, are they at the level to even perform in the first place at this race, and we'll see whether that was the case or not here, but you're right, that little track team at the start here, very nice, and it's also that balance of which riders they have, Jasper Stavin, the attacker, Milan, the backup sprinter, Pedersen, the in-betweener, but spoilers, they use that a bit differently in this race, and I can't wait to jump into that, but before we go into the race, have we gone over every, everything? I think we've done a pretty good preview of the start list. We have, probably should mention Binny for clarity and yep. uh, and Trentin because he's he's really good at Tudor. But yeah, that's it's that's it really. It's uh, yeah, MVP and MVP could win solo based on what we saw in E3, and Philipson could win a sprint based on what we've seen in Brugge de Pana and, and other races. So yeah, initially. 
uh, we saw a breakaway of Merku, Jakobs, O'Brien, Ull, Bloom, Monk, Lebert, De Bont. Uh, this was the early days breakaway. No, I was about to say no serious teams, but no like Alps and Trek or UAE represented or Visma. Not, not too many riders, and they got two. They even got five minutes. Uh, they really got a decent margin. There was no coverage. I don't know who was chasing. I assume Alperson. I assume Trek. <laughs> that's why uh, they signed uh, Tim. He's not on the start list. That's why they signed Darnola. Uh, so it was pretty well under control, even though you'd think, oh, five minutes with those hills. But nah, because it was about to kick off. But before it kicked off, I want to give a mention to the people that commented on the last podcast on YouTube, <laughs> because despite my pleas, I said, pick a joint training plan for me. And I was like, with a focus on stamina. And everybody <laughs> said, and the, guess what the most voted one was, Benji? I, I saw two very prominent ones. One was VO2 Max, the one I was joking about. And the other one was uh, Fabio Jakobsen sprint plan. <laughs> <laughs> What were those the most voted ones or Fabio Jakobsen's sprint plan? <laughs> so, <laughs> which I mean, I've, I've brought it upon myself, and so I'll read it out in the, in the Fabio Jakobsen sprint plan. Uh, you do a unique sprint workout each week, uh, it's a six week plan. And when I look at the training plan, it's still 13 hours a week, and it's I don't think it's too bad. Everyone thought they were trolling me. But actually, it's just a focus on sprints. Everyone thought it's like a track plan. So like, joke's on you. It's still a pretty normal plan because sprinters actually fit individuals. So <laughs> I'm actually not that unhappy about it. Like the first workout's two hours with eight minutes of uh, threshold intervals, which is like quite intense, obviously. Uh, but then others like two-hour endurance rides for the next three rides. So what I would say to everybody is the joke's on you. You thought you were trolling me. I'm happy with the Fabio Jakobsen joint cycling sprint plan, and that's what I'll be doing. Yeah, I think that's fair. Like when it comes to my goals, like Gold Ordino, I want to do a better time than last year. So yeah, don't do the I'm sprint probably, plan. I'm not, I'm not going to do the sprint <laughs> plan. I think I'm going to go for one of the endurance plans. So I'm not even going to allow the comments to have a take <laughs> yeah. on these. I'll just go to the list and select the one I like. There's like there's ones that fit on longer climbs, stuff like that. So that's going to be the one I'll be focusing on for the next month and a week. When are we seeing yeah, each other? Long, however long is till the Giro. Probably about six weeks, I'd say. About six weeks. Enough. Yeah, so that's what I'll be doing. Fabio Jakobsen's sprint plan, except my chain stays on when I'm sprinting. That's the only thing. <laughs> I mean, I wonder, I have to look. I don't know how in-depth the joint plan is on that, but I wonder if in the joint plan, it's about, it tells Mate. you how to keep your chain on the last 1K. <laughs> Training five is getting the chain off your bike during the sprint. I don't want to do that. I say crash, and I've had enough crashes this year. I should, I should be in my join in my notes in every workout. I should auto populate. That could be a feature they add: auto populate. Just don't crash today, buddy. Uh, uh, anyway, you should go check out joint cycling. There's plenty of plans for everybody. We'll be doing that plan. Uh, we saw some crashes before coverage started in Han Vabelham. Crashed by Narvaez, Swift and Stewart. Narvaez out of the race. And, uh, and then another crash by, by a Visma rider. Tratnik crashes out of the race. I think he had a concussion check. What I heard on comms mm -hmm. was that it was negative, but it quite a hard crash at the back of the peloton. So Visma had a shocker really last, yeah. last week. with Who's crashed? Van Aert, Laporte sick. Jorgensen crashed after the race. Tratnik crashed today. Van Baal crashed and had three punctures. Hagen has crashed, broke his nose. Yeah. I mean, no Jesus. But no, it crashed. You, were, you weren't even done. <laughs> That's crazy. It's been a shocker, yeah. And it's um, like, they, they build on their numerical advantage to try and beat Van der Poel in, in RVV and so forth, but there's not much left of this numerical advantage after the infirmary has gone through them in the last two weeks. So that's going to be uh, something to look at for RVV. Also to see whether the strength of their team in, in block is good at Dwarsdorf London where they do have a strong team depending on whether there's been adaptions towards that start list from those crashes but crashes aside shit was about to hit the fan because yeah. we hinted at it in the last podcast that there might be wind in the mood and then two days ago I, I checked the ticker again and there, there's, there was going to be wind in the mood and because 35k an hour hit wind and they basically go from Vurne down towards the Ypres area roughly and that means it was cross tailwind in like a very open area in a, yeah, the Muren, the marches basically is the name for it. So 
it was gonna be chaos, and it was instantly the case, and I swear, it's super annoying that there's no coverage of this, number one, like, it happens so much that the Mooden opens up that one day I hope we do get the coverage from Gen Dwebelheim from the Mooden. But that aside, following the tickers and trying to figure out who was in the who was in the echelons or not, it, it was it was a lot to try and follow. And I swear there was about 29 riders in the first echelon. And the teams that were missing were Lotto was missing, Bahrain was missing, UNOX was missing, Israel was missing, and Sport Vlaanderen. Five teams missing. And then and you're looking at the front mostly group. Missing. Yes, but Merlier's in the front group. Yeah. And that makes an interesting dynamic because then Quickstep starts pacing behind while having Merlier at the front, which was quite interesting to see, but that's because they want more riders at the front because they can't 100% trust on Merlier to be the man to deliver this home. And then you look at the other teams out there. Alpesen's there with Vanderpool, Philipson, and um, one extra rider. Not sure who the third rider was from Albison, four riders from the likes of Little Trek, including Pedersen was there, Steven was there, was Milan. Milan in first echelon? Yeah, 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 he was there. Uh, just next to that, Olaf Koy was in there. So you, you've got the most important riders of a lot of teams have made it into the echelon, and then you're wondering how can the others have missed it? Because you know echelons are going to happen, right? Like, everybody yesterday in the evening heard from their team or this morning in the bus, there's going to be echelons, make sure you're at the front right there. Is it because there's so many people fighting for it, or is it because they didn't have the legs to be in it in the first place? I mean, maybe you're out of position and someone drops the wheel in front of you, like with Niels Pollitt. Like, Niels yeah. Pollitt's got legs this, this season, there's no yeah. doubt about that. So clearly he was out of position, or I don't know, maybe he got bumped into a ditch. Maybe you, get, you just get pushed out at the wrong time. But there's also riders with, that don't have the legs because it's clear that with so many favorites making it, it clearly wasn't a surprise. Everyone knew this yeah. was going to happen. 35 kilometers an hour across Tailwind in Demura, it will split 100% yes. of the time. And because actually the perverse thing then is, because all the favorites make it, both attackers and sprinters, no team really thought to press on the advantage. No team thought why... Yeah. Like, why just pace full gas? There's Phillips and Coy here. Or why pace full gas if you're a sprinter's team? There's, there's MVDP Sturver here. So, it, it just, it, it went along. I think Pedersen and Trek tried to sort of push it along or split it again, but it wasn't quite the same. And actually, Group 2 starts coming back quite a lot after being on a pretty big gap before. Yeah, it was, when the, at a certain point, the ticker said 2 minutes 30, but I don't believe that was true at any point. It was no. a minute max, I reckon, and it went down gradually from that point. We're talking 150k from the finish line, the start of the moor, and that's where the echelons happen. Then there's 50k's of a gradual fight between echelon 1 and echelon 2, and the breakaway being ahead of that, being 6 riders that eventually get called by echelon 1. And the gap between echelon 1 and 2 started deteriorating in, I would say, the second half towards the, towards the hill zone, the last 30 kilometers before the hill zone. So... We're looking at the Scherpenberg coming up in 30k. Gradually, the group gets closer and closer, and it's on that Scherpenberg and Barnenberg, the, the first two climbs of the day, that it starts closing together, but it's, it shows that there's been damage. People in the second group have been suffering trying to get this back. People in group one have been suffering in the echelons as well. And I didn't feel like there was a, a complete merger of two groups. It felt more like it was two groups catching up together right at the moment when there's a hill and some riders from the second group make it into the first group because then it splits again and then there's a new split of exactly the same sizes after the Barnaberg. Yeah, I couldn't really figure out what was going on. Or I could really... <laughs> <laughs> it's hazy for me. I, I'm a bit crook as well, so bear with me. But Trek were the most active team and the strongest team today. Like, that's yes. just by far. And going into Belvedere 1... They were leading it out, which is probably the smart thing to do because you can isolate Vanderpool and then it's like, can Vanderpool go clear with 80 Ks to go and go solo against you? No, he couldn't even do that. He couldn't even, I mean, even, I mean, it's, it's, no one can do it. He couldn't do it on <laughs> Tienberg in E3 and now it's a lot more flat here after the first Kemmelberg. It's unlikely. So you can get rid of yep. all his teammates, put Philipson behind and maybe have numbers. So Trek. Uh, which is exactly what Van Hooydonk did last year. So Trek literally have in a lot in E3 and today 
they've replaced Visma in, in yep. the way in dominating the race. And they use Milan in that role. He attacks Sturver and Pedersen on the wheel of Van der Poel, Pithy there, Tim Van Dyke and Tiller, the other two that make it across with Van der Poel. And uh, you suddenly have a group. And also the gap is really big. Like it's not like there's sometimes on the first Kennelberg, there's like, okay, there's a split, but it's like three seconds. And by the end of the descent, when the fixed cameras finished, it's all back together. It was like a big gap. Yeah. J just to clarify, this is first Kennelberg, the Belvedere side. And you're right. Lil Trek was the one going into that climb. Monty Van der Poel made that attack. And then that group forms with those riders of Trek in there with the riders you mentioned, which is Piffy, Tiller, Van Dijke, Van der Poel, Pedersen, Stuyven and Milan. And you're also very right on the fact that then they started playing with Little Drag. Then they know they've got the numbers, three riders, but it's also curious to me the following that happened. So scenario after Belvedere, Milan makes that move, attacks from that group of seven riders and forces Van der Poel, Van Dijken, Piffy and Tiller to pay spa after Milan with Peterson and Stuyven in their wheel. The peloton is 20 seconds behind that six-man group. I don't believe that Van der Poel would ride as offensively in this race at that moment if Philipson wasn't in the peloton behind. As in, when the gap is 20 seconds, facing as hard as he did with Peterson and Steven in the wheel, that didn't, like, didn't sound like tactically the the best decision. Yeah, but why don't you just go back and have, uh, let's see who you, who's your man, man's got here. Vermeers? Why don't you just go back and have Vermeers and Sir and Kral pace then? Exactly. So I think this was tactically Van der Poel's worst race in a, and I can remember for a long time. And I think the reason for it is that he knew Philipson was behind and he knew he could play around a little. That's how, that's the excuse I'm giving him here. If Philipson's behind, Milan, I like Milan, don't get me wrong. Wanted to sign him. <laughs> I like, I think he's a great rider. But 80Ks solo, and you can see the way he was bobbing, and you yep. see the way he blew up, blew up in Omelope the last two years. It's not something to ruin your race over. That's, it's not Dylan Van Bala who you're like, actually, he could do this all day. It's, yep. He's a sprinter in the end. He's a classic sprinter. And uh, I was really surprised to see Van der Poel basically pull full gas behind Milan on the flat. Because between yeah. the two Kemmelbergs, you have, uh, yes, there's the Plug Streets between the sort of muddy... Hey, don't you uh, dare shit on our Plug Streets, man. No, no, no. I'm, I'm, I'm saying they're not uphill. Like, there's still a big draft yeah. benefit. Between the two, it's like 30 k's of flat. And I was thinking, 20 seconds. Doesn't Van der Poel just... Because the other guys weren't really working. Pithy eventually gave yeah. us a few turns. Van Dyke gave him two turns. Peterson's over no turns. Normally, he would just go back to the peloton. And then you have the peloton hold Milan at 25 seconds and Trek are kind of burning a guy in front. Instead, yep. Trek got exactly what they wanted. The race yeah. favorite, pulling full gas on the flat with Pedersen and Sturvin, the two strongest Trek riders in his wheel. And, uh, and then the peloton behind was kind of quick step. They really weren't making much headway because Visma weren't chasing... Rupama weren't chasing with Kung and Intermarche. I'll have a few words about them later. They're a disgrace today. <laughs> um, so it was just kind of quick step with Lampard chasing or, or Tudor a little bit. So very strange, actually. But Trek were up to the Plugstrap Benji looking rosy for Trek. But then it, got, it changed a little bit there. Exactly. Because we hit those plug streets. Yes, the gaps are, the gaps are starting to gradually increase a little bit because while Trek is also present with Milan at the front, with with Peterson Stuyven in that second group. In the peloton, you've got Kirsch and three other riders basically not blocking the road, but trying to upset the chase, is how I would classify it. Being in second wheel, and when the first rider goes at the front, there's a track rider at the front suddenly that doesn't want to pace. So stuff like that. And you saw that actively helping the, the groups in front. So that's also happening while all of this is happening. We head into the hill, 63 Plug Street. To, this is the first time I realized that these Plug Streets actually have a name. I think Hill 63 is a reference towards a hill that was very prominent in the World War back in the day. But Van der Poel attacks on a hill, on, on that Plug Street, not a hill, on the Plug Street. <laughs> he drops Van Dijkje, Tilder gets dropped, Stuyven gets dropped because of mechanical, because he has a back wheel puncture, and 
the problem is also that if you have a backhoe puncture on the on the gravel sector, your dude with a wheel is at the end of the bloody gravel sector. So you need to ride to till the end, then you're gonna go slower through the corners, then Van der Poel is literally attacking the group at that point. So who's left over? Pedersen's left over, Fifi's left over in the wheel of Van der Poel, and they're gradually getting closer to Milan at this point. So 60k, 6k to go. We're off to the Plug Street. Stuyven is now in Narnia behind the Peloton group, but he's gonna come back to the Peloton group eventually. And at the front of the race, we've got Milan with behind him three riders, 15 seconds behind him, Van der Poel, Peters, and Piffy. And then a minute behind Milan at the front is the Peloton. And there are teams there present to pace, but these block streets also prevent an organized chase, right? Yeah, prevent all people were like, oh, we're still kind of represented up front. Like Visma yeah. weren't chasing full gas for Koi at that point because Van Dyke was sort of in the middle. And the yeah the other teams like quickstep they're also trying to keep domestiques because everyone's thinking about the chase after the final kemmelberg but for trek with with Sturvin's puncture i thought that's really bad because now milan is eventually going to get reeled in and then if mvdp has the shape of e3 he basically can make it mano e mano with pedersen yeah maybe drop him second camel go with him and then maybe then drop him have another chance to drop him last camel uh, but Milan gets caught. Pedersen immediately attacks. Uh, Van der Poel closes. Actually, Pithy tried to jump first. And <laughs> it would have been interesting to see, actually, if Pithy had gone with, with say, Milan initially, what would have happened with Pedersen. Mm -hmm. But I do wonder if Sturver, because if Sturver's still here, after the Pedersen anticipation, Sturven will go, and Van der Poel will not close that move. No chance. He will close it. He closed Pedersen. And I wonder if Sturman was there, if the race actually does play out in Trek's favor, if it was actually yep. the, the sequence of events afterwards. But anyway, because Pedersen gets closed down, they actually all just start rolling together. Pithy's realized Milan's court looks a bit fucked. Okay, if I work with <laughs> these guys, I can get third. At worst, this is a big race. Yep. And he's got a good sprint, who knows? So he's got to pull at least a little bit if he's not too fucked. Pedersen's really feeling confident, but starts rolling through. I'm not too confident at this point. And Van der Poel, again, I'm curious. I thought he could have relaxed a little bit. And he, he keeps pulling really, really hard. I, I really was, I was surprised. And then Peterson goes to the front with a little bit of a move. It wasn't necessarily a full-on attack, but like a bit of an acceleration. Yeah, on the Monteberg or Barnaberg. This makes Milan struggle and basically drop off the back. So Peterson dropped his teammate, even though Milan probably wasn't going to be worth much more after that. Even though, after he drops... He returns and he attacks the bloody group, which yep. <laughs> this is just before the, the second Kamelberg. And even though that attack happens, you know that whenever Van der Poel does something on the next Kamelberg, which is inevitable, you will see Milan get caught on that Kamelberg. And we, we see that Belvedere a second time, but Milan gets caught so close that it's actually Peterson that makes the move here. And I'll be honest, Macho Van der Poel. He looked, looked like suspect. he was struggling. He looked suspect, didn't he? Yeah. Uh, he looked was... like he was folded double into his frame, is how I would describe it. We well, could tell because when he first went, Pithy's, Pithy started overlapping his front wheel to his back wheel. Yeah. I was like, oh, that's not... I mean, normally I like Pithy, but <laughs> normally, <laughs> normally that doesn't happen. And so, yeah, he, he just didn't look like he had that snap. Pedersen absolutely whacks it. He even gets gapped a little bit, Van der Poel, uh, but just stays in the wheel. And so the trio go clear. Milan's full dropped at this point. Uh, they also, when this happens, puts more time into the Peloton. They go clear. Pithy, Pedersen, Van der Poel. We have one Kemmelberg left. No more Plugstrass. The next Kemmel comes quicker, though. 17 Ks afterwards with the Scherpenberg yep. and the Barnaberg are, uh, in between. So actually much less flat here. The three basically roll turns. Pithy skips occasionally. Pedersen starts. Everyone's tightening their boots. But it looks like either MVDP had a weak moment or MVDP's really not feeling good or MVDP's a genius because <laughs> Pedersen starts pulling. He's full of confidence now. Yeah. He just starts pulling like the hardest of anyone in the group, fully backing himself before the last Gemmelberg. And this is the hardest one, the steepest one, I'll swear. They get to it. Uh, by the way, back to the peloton. Visma start chasing full. Quickstep really 
just we're chasing full. I feel like no, Renaud waited no, no, a no, long no. time. They, this is so the, before the camel. There's two things. Scherpenberg, they say everyone's chasing full. Okay. They got one ride out of Van Dyke or Rafini, and then Quickstep had two. Then all of a sudden, Visma disappeared off the front. Yeah. Quickstep stopped chasing. The gap was not that outrageous, right? 25, 30 seconds, maybe less. Yeah, exactly. Antomarche have like five riders. They got this rider called Binium Gourmet on the team. He's won this race before. <laughs> Don't pull. And they're like, not even passive that. riding. Not even that. Antomarche, instead of pulling, and, and Visma 2, Visma 2 should have put a rider uh, the whole way to the last Kemmelberg. Antomarche attack or anticipate with moves sitting on. So Turner, Ineos, they don't have a sprinter. They got to anticipate and go. It makes total sense with Turner, right? Or Sheffield. Yep. I can't criticize that. And Hugo Page goes with him. And I'm like, what the fuck are they doing? <laughs> Control the gap before the Kemmelberg to give Binny a chance in the sprint. No offense to Hugo Page, but he is not bridging a chasse attack with Ben Turner to Mads Pedersen and Mathieu van der Poel. And then another move goes, I can't remember who with, and another Antomarche rider jumps with him. I'm like, what are you doing? I understand if you want to do the old school points tactic and sprint with five guys at the end, I don't like it. Okay, but do that. But now you're anticipating with them for chasse-patates instead of pulling. It makes no sense. And being super passive in this race, at this phase in the race, but even earlier when they weren't helping the pace at all, even though they have someone behind and no one at the front, like, if you're not in front of the race, you can't win the race. So it was as if they wrote the entire race for, third. for a top five position. Yeah. Third wasn't even available earlier. So for a yeah, top five position. Yeah, because he's up the road still. <laughs> oh, I, I don't get what, what Anton Marche was doing here. Because it's and the last climb. I, like, Van der Poel's not going to beat Benny in a big bunch sprint. If you catch exactly. him, you're looking good. And in addition to that, You've also got the fact that it's not just that they're not helping, they're self-sabotaging their own chances. But anyway, Anton Rache, well, enough about them. We spoke about... Go ahead. Well, yeah. Visma, Quickstep, the other sprint, the other guys with the sprint, they lose the chance to win this race here or even get a better result here because the gap goes from 25 to 45 seconds for free to the Pedersen of Van der Poel group. And then, yeah, Pedersen goes on elsewhere, absolutely smashes it, pithy... Is full dropped, like on uh, Mont Saint Laurent when Van Aert dropped him in Kerner. Yeah. And uh, the same thing happened to him today, unfortunately. Fucking like, devastating. Yeah, man. I know. Really unfortunate. Then you have a really strong race, but because that last portion of the race, you get dropped by the people up front. Yeah. You're not going to have that result in the end. You're basically not going to end up with a proper result because of that, because you, you blew your race by being trying to be with the best, which I would never blame the rider for, but the results won't show how good he was today. I oh, know. Same thing happened, Kern. A real shame. Um, but yeah, Pithy was even maybe stronger today, to be honest. He was really, really, really good. And then Pedersen basically had MVDP almost on a gap. on us. I think he had him on a gap, actually, at points on the last time. Mm -hmm. So it was clear he was the strongest. They go clear. They work. Pedersen pulls also afterwards. In the 10, 15 minutes after the last Camelberg, it looked to me like yep. Pedersen was pulling 75% of the time yep. as well. And they, they kill Pithy. Um, they just put him out the back. and. Don't let him come back. Yeah, I think there was a headwind as well. Yep. And so he, first... he basically sits up for the group three, which is the Antomarche Turner group, I think. But the Pelton, what's also clear is that the Pelton for the Antomarche rider, they should have really clocked immediately. Like the Pelton's going to yep. catch those guys. It's, the Pelton was at 130, I think. In addition to that, you've also got the effect of those Kelmbergs make it so that the chase in the Peloton also get disrupted every time those hills happen because the group gets split into pieces. So, for example, after Osuer, Van Lederberg and Merlier were in a second peloton for a bit, which caused Asgreen and Lampard to look behind them while they were at the front. Basically, they were stopping the tempo, waiting for them to come back to then start pacing, which means that the gap grows from a minute to a minute 30 before they actually start their chase, which if it's a minute 30 and we're looking at 30, what is it, 35-ish kilometers, 37-ish kilometers after the last Kelmerbeck towards the finish line. Sorry, but sort of 34 kilometers. Sorry, but a minute 30 to Van der Poel and Mes Pérez and knowing that all the domestiques in that peloton are absolutely fucked. Sorry, I, I don't see it happening. But it would depend on whether Van der Poel 
keeps riding with Peterson or not. Because there's always the chance that Van der Poel at this point says, or a bit later in the race with like 10-15 kilometers to go, I'm gonna sit in your wheel now, because I've got Philipson behind. Which, it's a valid excuse because Philipson is on paper the faster sprinter in the, in the group behind. Merlier is also a pretty, pretty fast guy. But on paper, Philipson has a, has a chance there. And I don't know, seeing Van der Poel, how much he struggled on the Camelbergs, I think they probably, do you reckon they at least considered doing that? Uh, no, because he pulls full. He, he almost starts pulling more with Pedersen closer to the finish. Like, it was clear that Pedersen was strong on the Kelberg. It reminded me of Asgren, yeah. part, like when Asgren on the Paderberg, he was like, in 21, he was yeah. putting it into Van der Poel. And uh, it reminded me of that a little bit. And so Pedersen normally is a better sprinter than Van der Poel anyway, but then in, in San Remo, his sprint was kind of shit. I'd say it depends on the type of sprint we have, because we've had this discussion before already. We had the Osgren versus Van der Spool sprint and the Juan Finard versus Van der Poel sprints at the Tour of Flanders. Osgren versus Van der Poel, you look at a rider that is Kasper Osgren, which prefers a sprint that is a bit higher speed with a, a, a longer sprint, so like 300 meters, 350 meters, something like that. Machu van der Poel is the opposite on paper. He's the kind of rider that wants a shorter sprint at a slower starting speed, because that way he can benefit from ex acceleration in that sprint. And that's the, that's the comparison I saw in this sprint coming up, because if those two riders were, make it to, were going to make it to the finish line, which started to look like it, to be honest, Van der Poel, Mess Pedersen, and Van der Poel wants a slow start to the sprint and a shorter sprint, so that he can use that acceleration, while Mess Pedersen wants that longer sprint, but also a higher starting speed, so that acceleration of Van der Poel doesn't hit him as hard. But the problem there is, Luke, our producer, rightly pointed out, then Pedersen will have, will have to be strong enough that he can do a lead out to speed himself up into the sprint, because Van der Poel, if Van der Poel starts his sprint at the front, he's going to try and lower the tempo, right? Yeah, like Pedersen will need to up the tempo. Like what he did to Van Aert, they were almost at a standstill. Yep. And then it was like a cyclocross start sprint uh, in the 2020 Tour of Flanders. But yeah, it's, the, the group starts coming back quickly, probably because they eased up a little bit. You've got Quickstep fully pacing, Benoit and uh, Van Dijk, brother. Antemarche still, by the way, four riders in the group. Don't put a rider. Yeah. And just checking the results. They, the, the other riders finished... Yeah, like Mikkels finished 39th, so like, and Rex 16th. So if Binny improves a couple of spots, uh, it's more than a 30 point delta. Anyway, the, they're not coming back. The gap was too big. But what it does show to my earlier points is that a gap of 50 seconds or 40 seconds was, was closable because yep. there were enough teams. But they, the problem was before the last Camelberg, they lost it there. And uh, that's why I was thinking, Benji, to your point, the question you asked earlier, if they were so, if they're going to play the Philipson card, yeah, like couldn't they? I get, I get Van der Poel pulling to like five Ks to go, three Ks yep. to go. He was pulling in the last two Ks, yeah, and he was stretching his back. And he too also long. looked, yeah, I just think he pulled way too long. Whether it makes a difference in the end, I don't know. I think maybe it does. I think if you stop pulling a kilometer earlier, ultimately, the, the guy on the front is going to lower his speed. And in addition to that, you got to keep in mind that Philipson wasn't alone in the second peloton group and like the, in like the peloton behind. Yeah, I swear there point. were at least three Alpecin riders next to him. Søren Kra, oh, uh, yeah. Vermeers, and maybe a Ricard or something. I'm not sure who the, who the third rider was, but that's a lead out. So you have a valid, you have a valid backup there. So I, I indeed would have... I w Honestly... Pure tactically, I would have considered taking the Philipson card, but that's a, that's a gamble too. No, I wouldn't have done that because uh, his sprint, I got to say his sprint in, in sort of classic races hasn't looked as dominant to me this year, and you never know at the end of a long classic. I wouldn't have full played it, but I would have used it as an excuse to go in the wheel much mm -hmm. earlier, much, much earlier. And then yeah, that's what I mean, eh? Yeah, 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 yeah. 
you if you're Vanderpool, you 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 play the Philipson card as in like I've got Philipson behind, I'll stop with 2k to go, pacing, 3k, 4k, I don't even care. Yeah. Just not in the last 2k, because that was a bit late. Because Pedersen does it perfect, basically. Vanderpool eventually stops maybe 1,200 meters to go. Pedersen doesn't think twice. He's like, i got to get from here to 300 meters. Yeah. And he basically just keeps the speed exactly the same, or like, okay, maybe knocks a bit off. He does not let the speed drop. He just keeps on it. And he basically, and you, you saw him in Provence. When he's on yeah. a good day, Pedersen can basically ride at his threshold all day and then still do his best yeah. sprint, it seems like, from 300 meters. So... That's exactly Except what happens. Except, yeah, but that's not threshold all day. It's like ex yeah, yeah. more explosive. I think after a hard <laughs> race when he's on form, and that was clearly the case today because he gets to 300 meters, didn't think twice, fully confident, opens it up uh, with Van der Poel on the wheel, and it just it never looked like Van der Poel was coming, out, coming over the top of him. Van der Poel comes out of the draft, maybe 100 meters, 150 meters to go. He's not making up ground quick enough, and he pulls out like when... Uh, like when Asgren won, and uh, 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 Pedersen wins the strongman sprint, wins the race. Perfect tactics from Little Trek today and perfect execution, even with bad luck of Sturva in the Plugstrat, beating Van der Poel in the head to head sprint. Uh, Jordi Mayus third, Philipson fourth. So he didn't win the bunch sprint behind, but maybe Alberson didn't do a full lead out because they weren't trying to catch Matthew Van der Poel. Milan recovers to come fifth after actually leading yeah. out the sprint. Koi <laughs> sixth, Binny seventh, Merlier eighth. Groenewerk in ninth and Trentin 10th. So decent sized group, about 40 deep. Jordi Mayus, not on my bingo card to podium and fable him, but uh, <laughs> I thought it was Danny Van, Poppel, Danny Van Poppel. I was like, oh, that's a nice result for Van Poppel. Then Van der Poel, after the race ended, interview with him, he said, I suffered a lot today. I nearly dropped on the second Camelback. So not even the third one. He nearly dropped on the second one, he says. The strongest rider won today. And then... The interviewer rightfully asks, well, shouldn't you have used like the shouldn't your team have used like the Philipson card behind? And Van der Poel's response was, I'll roughly quote him because this is purely of memory, that he said, Well, first uh, first of all, Philipson didn't win the sprint behind. I I'm not sure that point really hits, because otherwise he would have had Van der Poel as a lead out. So that would have changed something when it comes to lead out. But his other point was, I'm in the World Championship jersey, I'm in that position, I feel like as a World Champion I should, I should pace here. And at a certain point, tactically you need to make a decision, and we made the decision, and yeah, we, we got second today. Which, fair point to be honest, like... It's oh, not, it's like not a guarantee Pedersen beats him in the sprint. Yeah, it, it's not a full guarantee, like, I had it at about 65% Pedersen for 35% Thunderbolt. Yeah, I think uh, Pearson was so confident to the point where I was like, wow, he, might, he either is crazy overextending or he just knows he's way stronger. Yep. Uh, and we clearly had the answer at the end of the race today. It's his second hand available in two. He won the COVID edition in 2020 uh, when he anticipated in the final ahead of uh, Van Aert and Van Der Poel who were closing each other. And he won in a small group sprint ahead of Seneschal there, I think. So it's, uh, he's got quite a nice Palmares, Mads Pedersen. Never spoken about in the same breath as sort of Van Aert or Van Der Poel, but he's a world champion, stage of the Tour de France, yep. stage of two, two Jan Vevelhem, Kerner, and uh, Trek looked very, very good today. And actually, I think uh, Trek and Jumbo, or Visma rather, they, they cannibalized each other between Tyenberg and Paderberg on E3. Yeah. And then with Visma basically being irrelevant in today's race, Trek could just like, focus fully on Van Der Poel and their tactics were really good. And uh, I wonder, like, sure, and this is Genvelen, let's not overreact, right? This is a yeah. very, very different race to Tour because of Flanders. Because the immediate reaction in Belgium was, oh, we're going into RVV with three favorites now. No. I'm going with one. One favorite. <laughs> 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 uh, we're talking about Vanderpool, right? We don't have two different favorites, right? Loris <laughs> Pitney! <laughs> Get him in. They're probably not even sending him. Um, <laughs> the, yeah, Vanderpool. Uh, it gives a very different race. It's, it's hills back to back to back to back to back. And this is three big efforts on the Camelberg. And the sprinters, the really like classic sprinters, are good on the Camelberg. Van Aert dropped Pedersen here last year. Uh, so let's not overreact too much, but certainly Little Trek have taken a big step that they were second in E3, first today. They are looking really, really good. And, uh, 
Yeah, they, they're they're based. They've been stronger than Visma in the last two classics. Not on opening weekend, but the last two classics, E3 and today, they've been stronger. Uh, today was expected, but E3 was a bit of a surprise. So that's uh, congrats to them. Any last thoughts on this race, Benji? Any other standouts? Things that surprised you? Takeaways for the Tour of Flanders? Well, I'm trying to wrap my head around how little Trek can use today and figure out how they can apply that at the Tour of Flanders because no offense to Milan, but in yeah, the Milan's end, Milan's less threat, he's irrelevant in the Tour of Flanders. Yeah. You got Schoens, though. You got Schoens, he then... Fully agree. But don't, don't, domesti don't domesticate Schoens. Domesticate? <laughs> Don domestique. He's a, he's a pet now. <laughs> well, half the time he's stronger than Pedersen, they make him doing a lead out into Paderberg <laughs> for Pedersen on the E3. Yeah, but Kirsch beat Peterson that day as well, but I also think that Kirsch should beat honestly. Right. Even though that Kirsch crash, by the way, we didn't comment on it. Yeah, a lot of people were, were, yeah, everybody was talking about some magical thing that made no, him crash, but descent of the Camelback pedaled in the what, corner. I didn't crash on that descent when I did it last week. Yeah, but you crashed on like 17 other descents <laughs> in the last two months. Um, <laughs> yeah, they should basically do exactly what they did today and anticipate and try and work over Van der Poel and also refuse to help him. Yep. This was the first time I can remember in a long time, apart from Pithy, a few, few round turns where people were like, no, Matthew Van der Poel. Because sometimes Van der Poel has come into these, the, the big races. Yeah. And he's been like in Dwell's Door, for example, last year or the year before. You, you're like, how are people helping him so much? Was that the but, Companard's Descent version? Yeah. And like people helping him so much. And then he just kills you. And then he gets the big race day and he's like, actually, I'm a level above everybody here. Whereas E3, <laughs> he was so good that today people are like, we're not helping you before the, the Camelbergs. We're just not. Until yeah, Pedersen nearly dropped him. My um, friend, there's now three favorites for RVV. Obviously, he's going to say, I'll be saying riding He today. will, it's though. Little... They, they will. They will. So like, don't be <laughs> fooled. Don't be fooled. Vulnerable big race rider. RVV, he will be good. <laughs> no uh, shit. <laughs> yeah. Okay, on to the, uh, the women's race, the, which is actually one of the longest races in the women's calendar as well, just like the men's race. 170 kilometers. They do two reps of the Kemmelberg. Uh, they do the Belvedere side and then the Oswear side. They don't do the Plugstraats. Uh, they still, I don't even think they do the, uh, they do Demura in the first 50 Ks. Uh, yes. But yeah, after 100 Ks, they do the same uh, final. But they do exactly the same final as the men's race with uh, Hills. And then the last Kemmelberg Oswear is uh, 35 k's from the finish. They still had about a cross tailwind, I think. Maybe even genuine tailwind into Vavilkem in the finish. We had uh, Lodi Kopecki, Marlon Reusser, Majerus, Ma uh, Femke Marcus, Vanderbrook Black, and Vibus for SD Works. So obviously the big favorites of the race. Die gets back in Europe. This is her second race. She was sixth in Brugge de Pana uh, in a sprint. And she, so she's back in Europe racing this year after uh, coming back on Wednesday. Well, she's been training here for a bit, but racing Wednesday, Grace Brown. But Trek also the second strongest team, just like in the men's race. Balsamo, uh, Hansen, Longo Borghini, Van Anroy, Van Dijk as well. And uh, then there's Charlotte Cool and Pfeiffer Georgie as the sort of attacker sprint option for DSM, Fermanick, Post and L. No Mariana Voss, uh, despite really good shape on opening weekend. Uh, so they were the main favorites, if I've not missed anyone, Benji. You're right. And I was looking forward to trying to figure out what the differences were in the level of the field compared to Omlop and so forth about a month ago. Because it's been some time we're closer towards the, uh, the holy week of RVV. And in this race, you've got basically the, the last portion of the men's hill zone, is, is how I see the parkour. But we went through the Muren with this peloton, and I didn't see any reports of anything happening. I was kind of surprised because I swear the wind didn't go down since this morning, but what? maybe the reports were wrong, but I didn't see any action in the moon. No, it seemed to be all like pretty much close together because with like 65, 67 Ks to go, there were, there were attacks on the first hills. So maybe SD were, I mean, you got to remember as well, the teams here are they have one less rider a lot of the teams have or some of the teams have five riders rather than the seven riders and the big teams are also all trying to protect leaders not that that means you know if you're sd works if you're royce i'll still put in the gutter but maybe like royce is not the best in crosswinds 
all the the hectic is my read on it too but yeah it seemed not as chaotic as the men's race in that yeah. phase benji like there was like a small split i think with about 120 k's to go but it was gone in like a few kilometers so i was like okay uh, i was hoping this would be an echelon zone into the hill zone but you're right it was the hill zones that the hills in the hill zone that was going to be the action here today and i kind of was expecting the kind of um the kind of vibe we got on every single hill in the classic so far this season where SD work smash, Kopecky attack. That's that's what I was expecting, and that's exactly what started it off because we've got that Barnabert Scherpenberg combo that starts it off with about 60k to go. Just before that, Elisa Longoborghini and Grace Brown crashed, but they got back up the bike. They were back in the race. So they were competitive from that point. No real harm done there. And the first person attacking, I think it was on the Barnabert, was Lotte Kopecky. Yeah. And there was a small split for a little bit, nothing too crazy. Like, five, six riders is my pure guess that was formed because of that Kopecky move. Royster was in a, a small group with Puck Petersen behind. Royster forced Puck to close that. Then the SM in the larger group closed everything. So that was a fast hit by Lotto Kopecky. And this is before we even hit that first Camelbatic Belvedere side. And that's where the, the big kickoff happened. Once again, we hit that Camelbatic Belvedere and... The thing with the Belvedere side as well is, Belvedere side basically starts with a cobble to the top. The Osuer side, which is the last one, has, has an uphill asphalt section, and then the cobble start. What became clear on this race is that on any Kamoberg, Kopecky doesn't attack until the cobble starts. <laughs> she yeah. waits until the first cobble hits, and then she starts smashing it. That's exactly the same that happened on the Belvedere side. So with 53 kilometers to go, Kopecky starts pushing the second the cobbles hit, and it starts splitting the group. And it was like the, the gradual splitting as we go towards the top and good riders that I was like, okay, this rider is on point. Puck Petersen, really good at this point. Persico, five for Georgie. No real track rider in the first five. And most importantly, Lorena Wibbers was so much better, so much more versatile then an omelope at the start of the year. She, she's back on point. She was back in the level that I expected her to be in, in classics, and she flew up the hill the same way that Kopecky did. And I was like, well, this race is over. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Because <laughs> this is the first Kemmelberg, and she's looking so good there. And it goes to show, it's, maybe it's a great climb for the sprinters. Uh, but yeah, they get Longball, Guinea, Balsamo, catch back up. And it's like with the men's race, with two of the best sprinters here, because Balsamo's in good shape, Vibas and Balsamo, yep. they both have one domestique, or not domestique, you know, Kopecky and Longo Borghini, one teammate, and then Georgie's got Charlotte Cole behind. There's no real... No real team wants to sacrifice, no real advantage yeah. yet to just press on the front and just go full gas. So they get chased down about 12Ks. Majerus comes back for SD Works and starts pushing... Uh, Letizia Borghese, she shows off the EF POC helmet they've been wearing in the road races, that aero <laughs> helmet, and she tries to anticipate, I think, before the Barnaberg, uh, before, which is before the last Osware, or the last Kemmelberg, the hardest one. Uh, and I think it was... The Canyon Rider was Alice Towers. It was Alice Towers. Oh. Uh, and so I, was, but I, I mentioned Canyon because I was like, where's Diget? Yep. Like, should not Diget be good at this? She, she was in the group on the, on the first calendar. She was uh, behind a little bit of a split, so she wasn't necessarily at the front there. Can we talk about the fact that UCI has a sock rule, but is there a bips length rule? Because I swear every time I see Diger, her bibs become shorter. <laughs> is it because of sock rule. She got the triathlete socks. Really? No, I don't think they're triathletes. <laughs> um, but yeah, you can pick her apart because she got the she got the bright pink bike and uh, the pink shoes, which actually I find helpful because like I like it doing like when I like Van Aert's helmet. I, I when, agree. Van Poel, when Van der Poel's in the dust jersey, yeah, I think it's really helpful. Because like, oh, there's the superstar. Um, <laughs> but in terms, of, I, I I still think she is a superstar in terms of talent. Yeah. But I was like, what's going on? Like, are you really going to wait for a bunch sprint? And her positioning is, you know, awful going to the climb. But anyway, Towers goes, Towers goes clear. Kopecky goes. Same really as the first one, Benji. Vibas is right there, almost looking like she could attack her. 
Like yeah. Vibas looked like she was doing it easy on the last Kemmelberg. Oh, 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 oh. And he was just kind of scary. ELB pops and Georgie goes with the two of them, which is probably good for, like if Georgie's not there, Kopecky and Vibas full gas relay. Yeah. Like Laporte and Van Aert. But because Georgie's there, and she's not going to pull with these two, obviously, uh, they don't really... I mean, maybe they should have just fully committed anyway because Viva's going to win that sprint regardless. But uh, it's what is curious to me here yeah. is group comes back. Which group? Peterson, Svinkles, Van Anroy, Longborghini, Royce. So yeah. you've got, you got world champ, your uh, Swiss champ, Royce. And you got Vibas, and Balsamo is not there, and two of Balsamo's best domestiques are in the group, so they can't chase you. Yep. They're not in the group behind. And SD works. Don't just put Royster on the front, and you just say, okay, 10 minutes, pull as hard as you can, and destroy the motivation. Like, as soon as you just, the, the, as soon as the, the Trek domestique pulls off on the group behind, everyone's going to not pull. Yeah. But she, but she didn't. Exactly, and to me, like, tactically, I would never make this gamble. As in, SD Works basically chooses, okay, we're not going to pull this eight-rider group with three of our riders in it. We're not going to pull that group towards the line. We're not going to have Royster do that tempo. We're going to choose to have Wibbers sprint against Balsamo, Consoni, Cole, by letting the Peloton come back instead of sprinting against non-sprinters yeah, in addition to that leg. the other disadvantage is that you then need to control the peloton until the finish line it's a big group which means Royster will have to pace anyway yeah yeah yeah. it doesn't mean you do less work it, it doesn't mean <laughs> you have to do less work it means you you'll basically stop for 30 seconds to a minute and then you have to do the same amount of work anyway base just about yeah the other option is, okay, you, you, you have a team dynamic where you can't just say to Royce, get on the front and just pull us full gas. Okay, anticipate with Royce then. You should be able to do that. You should? Like literally, you have like the fastest sprinter in the world. Like she's so dominant and she's against Georgie. Like, and then Kopecky and... can also manage other anticipations in the final. Exactly. Like so... you, you can't lose. So... Choice one for me is having Royster pace. Choice two is maybe attacking with Royster, like you mentioned. But yep. Royster hadn't been looking the strongest in the race yet so far. Yeah. Still, she won but this race by about three minutes last year. The choice they do make is having the peloton come back. And from that point onwards, we're talking about 25 to 30 kilometers, where it's a, a peloton group where SD works with Royster as domestique and Little Trek. With Alan Van Dijk and Van Androoy, Van Androoy as, as domestiques, they try to control any attacks that follow. And I gotta give a major shout out to Movistar and FDG yeah. for keeping up rolling attacks in the last 25 kilometers. I think it was in the last 15 where they really put it, put it down in the last 10 kilometers with Norsgaard, I think, was the first one. Then Makai attacked 100 times for Movistar. It's probably an exaggeration, but it felt like 100 yeah. times. And every single time a domestique from Little Trek or SD Works had to close that down. The fact that those two teams were controlling shows that Little Trek believes Balsamo might have a chance at beating Wibbers. Yeah. I wasn't so sure about that, but they might prove it true or not by the end of this race. She's won quite a bit already this year, so she's better than the last two years, or last year at least. And when it comes to SD Works, they trust that, uh, that Wibbers, well, otherwise they wouldn't have made the decision to wait on the peloton anyway. Yeah. They trust that Wibbers can win the sprint anyway. So still risky though. Like uh, I agree. if more teams joined Movistar and FDJ, it was it Berto? I was going early as well. Victoire Berto? Uh, yeah. I don't know, but ja ja Jade Vielle from FDJ as well. She also started attacking, and then it really came down to the last three kilometers where those domestiques, Alan Van Dijk, for example, she's gone through a lot already and Royster yeah. in a corner or in a certain place went she off road. In the bike path. So she ended up being behind the peloton. So that's another domestique I can't respond to an attack, which yeah. means it's a perfect attack for a fellow Australian of yours to make a move, right? Grace Brown goes really strong attack, good timing, and it's the 
it, uh, this is where I was looking for Daigat. Because, like, Daigat's not going to... I was looking for Daigat thinking this is the moment. Because Movistar have softened up Trek and, and uh, SD works really well. And Grace Brown hits it. And it's a big gap. And you see Van Dyke pulling, pulling, pulling. And when they start looking, looking, and pulls off, I was like, ooh, she might have it. The only problem for her, Grace Brown, was it was so close to the finish. Uh, UAE start pulling. They start doing the lead out for uh, Consoni. So they were quite strong in the finish today. And, you know, they wanted to get a good result. They're not going to get a res- You know, they- Consoni is actually a good sprinter. So I understand it. Uh, but, yeah, Grace Brown gets reeled in. There's a lead out then from Pfeiffer Georgie. Uh, Kopecky kind of gets in the middle of it. Then Kopecky launches a second time. Vibas is in the wheel. Vibas launches. You think this can only go one way. They've done it perfectly, this lead out. And suddenly Balsamo's in the wheel. She's coming out of the wheel, squeezing up the barriers. Bike throw on the line. Very difficult to tell. Benji will say, he says to me, I test. I said Vibas. And the I test never lies. Vibas. Confirmed. Didn't even see a side on. Don't need a side on. Don't need a helicopter. Just give me front on at a low angle moving camera. I'll tell you. I've watched. You know how many horse races I watched? How many bobs? <laughs> like bike race, easy. You've got the eyes for it. I clearly don't. Every single time I'm like, I think Balsamo won. I literally was like, I think it's Balsamo. <laughs> Everyone always thinks the quicker rider come from behind wins because yeah, but- their eye remembers them after the line coming up. It's like with uh, Morgado and. Uh, well, your man. But X. Yeah. And before the line, well, on the side on shot, replay of the finish, it looked like Balsamo threw her bike too early and that yeah, Rivers she threw, threw her bike the, at the correct time, yeah. which then resulted in the result we have today, which is Lorena Rivers wins Kent Wevelgem. We said for a very it long time. Yeah, we <laughs> like it, it could have been much less close, but hey, I'm not complaining. Oh, yeah, that it was they a made great it a great bit... last 25k. <laughs> so, thanks for the bad tactical decision. That Can led... I play devil's advocate. Okay. Do you reckon they were thinking it'll be easier for us if we can harness the team help of Little Trek because they'll go for a sprint? I don't think I don't think you can count on that. Yeah, I agree. But that's just to play devil's advocate. Maybe they're thinking, okay, well, then we'll have other teams Mate, help. If Little Trek also rolled attacks... Yeah, if ELB attacks... As D-Works ain't winning this race. If ELB goes with, with Grace <laughs> Brown, she wins. Then Kopecky would have had to, like, counter She wouldn't have. They were boxed in doing, waiting for the lead out. They weren't going to yeah. do it. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, I'll do the... Uh, Lorena Vivas wins in a, in a photo. Still, Balsamo's in good shape. She won the last two races. She won last weekend yeah. at Trofeo Alfredo Binder last Sunday, and she won on Wednesday at... Or Thursday, rather, at Booga de Pana. Consoni third. Charlotte de Cool fourth. Uh, Confolonieri for Unix 5th, Sierra 6th, Peters 7th after being quite strong on the hills, Toledo de Jong 8th, Schweinberger 9th, and Maggie calls Lister for Roland 10th. Uh, but, 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 but. Shout out to Movistar though, I thought they were really good today. For the last four years we've been shouting for Lorena we was that she can win Ken Wevelgem, so I think it is actually quite a milestone in and not she only in her life, but in our lives, because I've been crying about this. That happens for so it's long. Big, that... It's not a big master in my life. Just... <laughs> <laughs> Mate, I've been dreaming of this day. <laughs> Maybe not last year, after SD works, we're winning a lot. But I'm happy for Weebus that she can scratch that one off, even though, well, the next thing is become even more versatile and try and win RVV, right? RVV, that's, that's going to be tough. But she. Uh... It is, but part of the game how many wins does Voss have 250 that's gonna be difficult uh but <laughs> <laughs> how many wins Cav have 163 does Lorena Vibas pass Cav she's on 76 wins how many wins does 76 150 she can beat she can pass Voss Cav's on one no no Voss on 250 oh, 250 <laughs> she, she can, she she's pass. only 25 she can pass Voss nah, it's yeah she she Mate, we're, we're, we're in March and she already has five victories. So from 18, so in the last, she wins like 12, 15 races a year. She, and she, she, 15 years, 15 times, 15 is 225. She, bring... needs, she needs to ride till she's like 40 and win the same rate. <laughs> I bring breaking news. Yeah, yeah. Royster has been disqualified. Ooh, what for? 
I don't fucking know. Uh, Luke, oh. producer, suggests that it might be because of the bike path thing, but I don't think she did that on purpose. She, she accidentally someone ended up there. checked her on. Yeah, I, I mean, <laughs> she didn't exactly procure an advantage. She got dropped <laughs> and had to chase back on. How did she get disqualified? It makes it's no like, sense. Are you serious? <laughs> it might. It could be something else. I don't know. But uh, um, sorry, but if that's the reason why it's a bit fucked, mate, that is a joke. <laughs> like, I'm sorry, but the amount of guys I see hitting bike paths in every race or hitting the corners, <laughs> nearly taking people out, and you're gonna do that when Royce, at least, were being dropped at the end of the race when someone. I didn't see how she ended up there. I assume it wasn't a choice. <laughs> Maybe she's something else. Maybe she's something else. Um, but okay. How do you how do you know she got disqualified? Uh, Luke just told me in the chat that we can both see. Ah, uh, maybe though she's trying to come back behind the car. Who knows? Uh, okay, that was Convergulum. I thought the the women's race it wasn't as exciting on the camels, but then the final thirty k's was actually really really good. Whereas the men's race, we kind of waited the last thirty k's to see the sprint. I thought both races were really quite good. I really enjoyed uh, the women's race, and uh, even though. So like I said in the other races, even though SD Works win, it was much more of a fight, and I thought very entertaining right until the last. So uh, on to yeah, on to Dwarz Dwarf Lana affair, the SD Works train. They have Kapeki and Vibas uh, and Volering there, so that team yep. is uh, stacked. But Voss Voss comes back, so she's on the yeah, she was missing. She won Omelope, so we'll see see how Voss goes. Uh, other news: Volta to Catalunya. Uh, Pogacic won the final stage. He also won yesterday. He won four stages and the GC. He won by 341. Uh, Lander second and Bernal third. This is Bernal's uh, on five minutes. This is Bernal's best result. It's got to be his best result since he crashed. Uh, off the top of my head. He, he's looking way better. I know he's racing. He's done 27 race days, but Paranese top 10, seventh. Camino third behind Jonas. Colombia fifth and now third in Catalonia behind Poggy. Like, that's pretty good. And yesterday he was really, really good in a difficult stage. So um, I'm really happy to see Bernal like that. But with Poggy, yeah, he, he, uh, I don't think anyone's won four stages in a, one week for a long time. But he, uh, he basically, he got attacked by Stevie Williams on the last, on the last uh, Monduic in the circuit. Yeah. He, he responded calmly, clawed him back. Almeida then actually countered really strongly, which was smart from UAE. Decathlon did a really good lead out, but uh, Poggy was just too good in the sprint, and uh, Godon will probably be kicking himself. I think he came second. Guillaume Martin third. Uh, I think Williams could have won the stage. I think he just did too much before the sprint. I think he should have focused on picking the right moment. Um, but yeah, anything from Catalonia, Benji? Final thoughts? Honestly, just Pogacar did what he had to do. He had to destroy the competition at Catalonia. That's yeah. what we expected before the race. As written, as they say in Dune, like that, that's what I was expecting, and that delivered. That being said, I was very happy to see Landa be as good as he was. And I was also very happy to see Bernal as good as he was. To see them for really, this race. That was really nice, yeah. Was that cyclismo? That was cyclismo. And that makes me think what would this race have been without Pogacho at the start? We would have seen a battle between Landa and Bernal for a GC victory in a one week race. Sorry, but I would have paid money to see that. The, the reality is, we had Benji, 2013 to 2019, the races weren't as good a lot of the time. <laughs> this wasn't the best race either, but the reality is without <laughs> Poggy... It was a fucking boring GC race, man. Yeah, Come but on. without Poggy here, they're just not as aggressive. Poggy forces... He, he makes everyone show who they are. Um, by attacking so early, it'd be more cagey. Maybe that would be good. Of course, it would have been so more maybe, entertaining. Yeah. You know, don't they have like this discipline on track? Like, isn't it Kieran or something where you've got like a rider or a, a motorbike before yeah, there's yeah, a yeah. few riders that are sprinting and the motorbike <laughs> goes out of the way? Maybe Pogachar yeah. is just a... Racers Adam, should hire Pogachar as a... <laughs> <laughs> the tour. Okay. That's what he did. He just pulls full <laughs> gas, drops everybody. <laughs> <laughs> races should hire Pogachar just to be there but not be included in the results just for the sake of opening up the race but then again they won't respond because they don't give a fuck if he doesn't send up in the results <laughs> my yeah. theory doesn't work <laughs> yeah yeah 
And then eventually, even when he is there and he is counting on GC, they still don't respond because they're like, fuck that. I'm already five minutes behind. <laughs> <laughs> um, other Chris Harper, excellent result. Uh, he finishes sixth. That's got to be his best ever GC result. Uh, I, I'm counting this above UAE to a fourth. So he was excellent after a really good Paranese. Uh, Vlasov solid again. He missed out on the podium because of Bernal's smart move on uh, Isidre yesterday. Enric Mas had cojones. He probably deserved fourth. Yeah. Uh, he got kicked, cooked in the valley. Lenny solid again. Tiberi very, very good on the actual high mountain stages, but weaker uh, yesterday. To, no, he solid yesterday. Tiberi was, was Tiberi. He was no good on Volta. He was really good on Portnay. So he uh, he was good. I made another top ten and uh, Visma. Just like in the classics this week, they had a shocker. Kuss thirteenth, completely cracked yesterday. And uh, after he looked like he was coming back because he was fourth or fifth on uh, Portnay, and then Otterbrooks was like way out of GC and he didn't start today. I don't think so. Um, they didn't Thoughts? have a good good race at all. Giro d'Italia is upcoming. For Gartra's cleaning a race like this, let's be honest, isn't this his Giro competition? No, the Giro competition is better. Not that much better. Because the other GC riders, like, they do not carry their peak all year like Vingegaard, Remco, Rogan, and Pagaccia. That's also the big difference. Not yeah, just the peak level, it's Leto carrying the good. peak. Yeah, but look at Hindley when he won the Giro. You know, he came, what, 13th in Catalonia? But Hindley's not there, right? I know, but I'm saying other GC riders like Simon Yates, like O'Connor, like Thomas. Thomas here training. I, I know. Thomas was training. Simon Yates was awful in this race. Yeah, yeah. Like, But I also... He should still clean them at the Giro. Yeah. But... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he should. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> no, but I, I, he should still clean them, but I think the, <laughs> the competition should be better. Mate, his biggest competition might be... Nah, probably not from his own team. Jay Vine's good, but... Nah, one know, in the race is one boss. Um, exactly. Yeah, but there's the Lavinia stage. Max Poole should be good, but that's also top five material, maybe. Not. Bernal should do the Giro. I know I've been saying this man needs a break. Fuck it. Send him straight to altitude. <laughs> <laughs> and send him to the Giro. Because, listen, the Tour de France... He's, he's good in the cold. He's good on the, the long, hard, attritional stages. He's a little guy, so like the hustle and bustle in the sprint stages, I don't think is the best for him in the Tour. The Vuelta's super punchy. I think the Giro, and the Giro, as you just said, Benji, like I agree, the Giro depth of GC start list is atrocious. Like compared, yes, Pogacar's going, but like... Pogacar wins the Giro by five minutes. Yeah, like if it's less than five, then something's gone wrong, right? Yeah. Which, he, won the, he won the tour in 21 by five minutes. That sucks having that feeling going into it. I have zero hype when it comes to Giro GC right now. Yeah, let me look. Just like, and every time I'm like, oh, let me find a really like high Tiberi mass. top five let, candidate. <laughs> I'm like, let me find a stage that's good. And I realized they designed a Vuelta parkour this year. <laughs> and like these stages, they're not even Giro stages. Um... <laughs> You Jan isn't looking that good. Like, he's looking worse than at Bora. Yeah, he's, he's terrible here. Um, but, like, even the Lavigno stage. Pfft. Yeah, yeah it's, gonna, it's a long stage. Who knows? Who knows? Because the thing is, right, like, who's going to have the cojones to, to th two minutes, say they're two minutes behind Pog, best case, unlike, mm -hmm. in that Lavigno stage? Who's going to have the cojones to try and put it into him there? Pedro Quintana. He crashed today. <laughs> he crashed out. <laughs> um, and who has the team to do it? So that's my the concern. Reality is that Pogacar will gain a gap on one of the first mountain finishes, and we're going to see a battle for second, third, podium, top five, top ten for the rest of the year. That's how the race will be ridden, and that sucks going into it. I'll still and pick Simon Yates in the preview. And the thought as well is... He's not doing the right. Then people are going to be like, yeah, but Pogacar can crash or he can have bad luck or something. Yeah, of course. I don't want to go into that uh, Grand Tour thinking a rider could crash or something, you know? If, if it's a rider that crashes almost every Grand... Like, Roglic at the Tour de France, there's, there's a solid chance that there's something that could go wrong. Pogacar does not have that history. So 
I don't go into Grand Tours expecting Pogacar to crash. Um. Yes. Sorry, but that one you can't. He has a he has a he has a, a pattern of almost being barriered every now and then in a, in a stage race, but it never happens. Crash lost two twos to France. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Come yeah, on. Not exactly <laughs> sprint running. He's trying to tackle the Spandel descent. That's a, it's a, it's a bit not exact. Doesn't exactly count. Uh. Yeah. Listen, I'm looking through the start list, and um, it's uh. Yeah, nothing's jumping out of me, I must say. Danny Martinez and the Bahrain train. <laughs> but aren't, and ironically, even in... Don't start the Even Don't in start. classics form... You're a fucking Belgian Bernard media would... plant. <laughs> <laughs> even in GC, even in classics form, he would top 10 the Giro. We do one if interview he goes with all the standard. And you're like, how about... <laughs> top 10? Yeah, of course, you know. But uh, I'm not sure... In GC this. form, he top 5 the Giro. Mm, nah, you're underrating. You're underrating Ooh. people like Tiberi and Caruso and Martinez. Um, I, I have those riders. Martinez will have a bad day. Probably. Anyway, on that positive note, <laughs> <laughs> we just <laughs> roasted the Giro. <laughs> nah, we got, I'll, I just look. Simon Yates isn't even going, so <laughs> I'm all in. I'm all in on Bok, and he's. I'm friends with Ben. So Eddie Dunbar, like, my friend. I, I'm just going all in on Ben O'Connor. Um, that's the only option. Plop doing the Giro. He's on the on the star list, and it would logically just, fit with the Olympics. I'll just go full Australian bias then. <laughs> go for it. Um, Van Seven on the Wins GC. Ala Philippe's on the provisional start list. Well, just Van Seven. He's a bit of a selfish rider, I think. I don't Seen know. A few I think so. I, uh, and Cavagna. It's hard for I, me to say that. Did I roast Cavagna I feel that vibe. Yeah, you've ro you roasted Cavagna a few times. I'll, I'll go again. I know no one's listening anymore. This is in place of the weekly show. <laughs> if I was Las Cano, I rewatched E3 because obviously it didn't exactly go well for Visma, so yeah. I rewatched it. I rewatched E3. If I was Las <clears throat> Cano, or if I was team management, he ain't riding the rest of these classics. Disgrace. Because he wasn't cooked. You have Las Cano in the group. Ivo Oliveira has waited to pull Pollitt across before Paterberg. You have Lascano in the group who looked stronger than everybody except Van der Poel and Van Aert. And Cavagna not only didn't pull, and he wasn't cooked dropping off the back, because he's coming through third wheel, Pollitt and Jorgensen would pull, and he would skip and actually disrupt the group. Not even just sitting at the back because he's cooked. Then yeah. when Jorg accelerates, he has the legs to initially go with Jorg on the wheel. So he's not completely bonked or anything. I couldn't believe what I was watching. If I was Lascano, I would be furious. Because if he pulls absolutely full gas from when Lascano gets across to him, maybe Lascano gets over the Paderberg, and who knows? Who knows what happens? Maybe he gets second. Uh, so if I was Movistar, I wouldn't have been happy with that. But um, I just had to get that off. Because viva Lascano. Like Lascano, can we say now that Lascano is not, he's not a one-hit wonder? He's like a genuine elite classics rider. He writer. was never a one-hit wonder. Nah, Dwarz Duel, come on. I didn't... No, after Dwarz Duel, I didn't think this guy's gonna be that good in every race. Well, I was expecting him to be like a classic guy, like... I thought he was a breakaway I already rated him more than Garcia Cortina after that. Yeah, I mean... Yeah, but... <laughs> <laughs> but like... With Betty all winning RV, I immediately thought one hit wonder. With Lascano, I didn't have that feeling after Dwarz Duel. I was like, yeah. oh, we've got a new guy on the block. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's young, yeah. I didn't think he'd be this good. Uh, so he's really, really good. So uh, yeah, Viva Las Canas. Maybe he wins through a Flanders. Who knows? Uh, that's all from us. We're not doing a weekly show because, yeah, I'm feeling a bit crook and I've got to travel next week. And we have our uh, film dropping uh, mid next week, which we've got to continue the edit with as well. So that's taking up a lot of our time, but it'll be worth it in the end. Uh, thanks to Join for sponsoring the episode. Hope you enjoyed it. And uh, we'll see you with. Uh, the Tour of Flanders preview in the middle of the week. Until then, yeah. ciao.